COVID-19 in children. And then also she'll be talking about treatment. And then we'll wrap things up with a question and answer where anybody can ask any question. We'll do the best we can to answer that question. All right, so next slide. So yes, initially let's talk about epidemiology and transmission. Next slide. Where are we at? So next slide. So if you look at this, uh, this is actually from the Worldometer website. And these numbers can somewhat vary depending on <clears throat> which website you, you look at. But no matter how you slice it, the world now has over 26 billion cases. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that. They're getting about almost 300,000 new cases a day. And there have been almost 900,000 deaths. So in the world, there are about almost 6,000 deaths per day, roughly. <clears throat> now, this, uh, these statistics are from a couple days ago. Um, the thing to notice just underneath that is the USA, um, the US now has over 6 million cases of COVID-19 with a, you know, about 40 to 45,000 new cases a day. Now, I know that number sounds pretty bad, but it actually was pretty it was actually worse about a month ago. That number was in the 70s. So we had over 70,000 new cases a day. So things are at least um, improved. They're, not, they're still not what I would call good, but they're definitely improved. Um, <clears throat> in the US now we have close to, a, it's about 190,000 deaths with about 1,000 new deaths per day. So you can see that Brazil and India are, are second and third, but there is no nation that is within even 2 million cases of us. So the US in terms of COVID-19 cases is the worst by far. And you can notice if you look at the number of total cases in the US and in the world, the US makes up about a quarter of the total cases in the world. Next slide. So this is Santa Clara County. Um, you know, I thought I would emphasize kind of where things are, uh, are at mainly here in Santa Clara County because that's really what affects us the most. But the total number of cases is about 18,000 now in, the, in Santa Clara County with about roughly 200 new cases per day, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Um, the total deaths, about 250 cases. <clears throat> and right now, there are currently about 130 ho um, people hospitalized. Next slide. Sorry, I'm running into some issues here. Let me. Mm. There you go, thanks. Oh. Okay, great, thanks. So this is actually a timeline looking at um, COVID-19 cases in Santa Clara County. And you can see, you know, back around the shutdown, that's when, when cases actually were spiking. And uh, in April, they reached a peak where the daily case count in Santa Clara County was still under 100, but it was in the, the 70s and 80s at times. So with, uh, with sheltering at home and all the, the preventive measures, the numbers actually improved significantly. And you can see in May that the cases actually came down to you know, under 20 a day, you know, sometimes in the single digits. So, but since then, so after, Memorial Day in May, you can start to see that the, the numbers are starting to climb. And then particularly after July 4th is uh, sort of a marker when things really started to take off. 
And so the case count right now in Santa Clara County, well, actually in, in late July, they peaked in the 300s. And currently the numbers have come down somewhat. They're now in the 100s and 200s. So as I, as I showed you earlier, the average is about 200 roughly. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is sort of a, you know, a description of the, the number of cases by different demographics, okay? And in the far left upper hand corner here, you can see cases by age group. And you can see that the majority of cases are actually in, um, in, in uh, individuals 60 or less or 50 or less. So um, in a way that's good. It means that those who are at the greatest risk, there's not as many cases. So, uh, but that does show you that probably um, the, those who are younger are probably out and about more and coming in contact with, with uh, sources more often. So you can see next to that on the right is cases by gender. It's about even, men and women tend to be about even in terms of cases. If you go to cases by ethnicity or race, um, you can see Asian is about 10%, Caucasian is about 10% um, as well. Um, African-Americans interestingly are fairly low, it's only about 2%, but <clears throat> you can see the, Latino or Hispanic community actually make up more than half of the cases. So that's 55%, that's pretty huge. So I don't believe that this is anything, this is not a genetic issue. It's, it's more, I think, due to socioeconomic factors and also um, Hispanic families tend to be very tight knit with multi-generational um, households. So that's, that's probably more true with them than with other um, ethnicities. So if you look down here in the bottom left, you can see case, cases by source of transmission. The key thing to note here is that um, only about, in, in only about a third of the cases are we able to actually trace their source of, um, of infection to a particular case. So most, most, uh, most cases of COVID, we do not know where they got it from. Okay, next slide. So this is actually from the CDC website. It's um, coronavirus mortality risk by age. So if they, what they did is they had a, the control group is the 18 to 29 year old group. Um, that's the third group from the left. And you can see that's their comparison group. So they. They looked at what your risk is of being hospitalized and dying um, based upon age. So if you can see by hospitalization, so for me, for example, I'm in my 50s now. My risk is four times higher to be hospitalized from COVID-19 compared to somebody in their 20s. But my father, who is in his late 80s, has a 13 you know, his risk is 13 times higher than compared to somebody in their 20s of being hospitalized if he gets COVID-19. And you can contrast that to, um, say, my daughter, who is 16. Her risk of being hospitalized is nine times lower than someone in their 20s. And you look at death. Uh, so my, um, you know, sad to say, but I have a 30 times higher risk of dying compared to someone in their 20s if I get if I get COVID-19. And my father's risk is, you know, over 600 times higher, whereas my daughter is uh, 16 times lower her risk of being of dying from COVID-19 if she were to acquire it. Next slide. So this is, um, I guess the point of this is, you know, coronavirus is serious, but we shouldn't panic. And you can see here that, um, you know, comparing influenza risk. So the death rate from influenza is only about 0.1%. The death rate in the US from COVID-19 is about 3%. Here in California, it's about 1.8%. And the good thing to notice here is that in Santa Clara County, our death rate is actually fairly low at only 1.4%. Um, and 
for the Spanish flu back in 1918, um, their mortality rate was somewhere above 2.5%. So I think it's a good thing. I think it, it does say that here in Santa Clara County, our, our fatality rate is actually pretty low. So that is a good thing. It's a good thing to be here in Santa Clara County. But again, um, <clears throat> you'll notice that, you know, there have been arguments that, you know, this is no worse than the flu and that's simply not true. So the, the mortality rate from flu is only about 0.1%. And even where things are good here in Santa Clara County, it's still many times higher than that for COVID-19. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about transmission. So there have been, <clears throat> there is some evidence now to support that. Um, well, let me, let me point out that when we talk about respiratory droplet versus um, aerosol, we're really talking about the size of the droplet. So aerosol is considered to be droplets that are less than five microns, okay? And a micron is about a millionth of a meter, okay? So uh, it's pretty small. But uh, respiratory droplets are usually considered to be above five microns in diameter. So um, there, are, there is evidence now to show that, that um, aerosol does play a role in terms of transmission, but, um, and of course, you know, fomites like coming in contact with um, some sort of inanimate object that can transmit um, COVID-19, like a doorknob or a countertop. Um, those are possibilities, but it's still transmission is primarily via respiratory droplet. So, and that is including from people with and without symptoms. So it's, it's not totally clear how, what percentage of COVID-19 cases are asymptomatic, but I've seen numbers as high as, you know, they think perhaps as high as 25% of cases are asymptomatic. But those individuals that are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic can still transmit the virus. So I want to make that point because, um, you know, it's, it's um, you know, if you go to a party and, you know, there's a large number of people there and, and even if everybody there says, you know what, I feel fine, I don't have any symptoms, that doesn't mean that someone there isn't positive and, and can still transmit the virus. So for those who do get symptoms, the mean or, at, or roughly the average time for people to develop symptoms is about five days. However, almost everyone within 11 days gets symptoms, okay? Everyone who does get symptoms, that is, okay? Next slide. So r not is sort of the measure of about how uh, the average number of people who become sick from a single infected individual. And this just gives you an idea comparing different viruses. So the flu, as you can see, is about 1.5. SARS was about two to five. COVID-19 is somewhere in that same range, about two to three. But measles, of course, is actually very, we know is very, very contagious. So you can see that, you know, as many as 16 people from just one person usually gets, um, usually can contract the disease. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about prevention. I'm sure, you know, next slide, you're, you're all familiar with um, a lot of these measures. So try not to touch your eyes or your face. I know that's very difficult because a lot of times we do this subconsciously. So um, but I would encourage you not to do that if you can consciously think about that. Obviously, wash your hands um, thoroughly and often. Um, social distancing, you want to maintain at least six feet of distance between you and others when you're out in public. And you can see that picture of someone on a mountaintop. That's the ultimate, I guess, social distancing. Um, he's not wearing a mask, but he's in the middle of nowhere. So I guess it, it's uh, pretty safe. Next slide. So let's talk about hand sanitizer. So, you know, nowadays you can actually get hand sanitizer, you know, in it's, they sell it everywhere now. So I, we just bought some actually at Costco recently. 
But the key point is um, there are varying amounts of ethyl alcohol in, in different hand sanitizers. Um, you want to make sure that any hand sanitizer you buy has at least 60% ethyl alcohol. And benzyl conium fluoride is not as good as ethyl alcohol. So when, when you do buy hand sanitizers, make sure that it's at least 60% um, ethyl alcohol. Um, I saw some of these hand sanitizers have as much as 70%, which is pretty good, but it, make it at least 60, okay? Next slide. So let's talk about masks, um, to wear or not to wear. I mean, I know initially there were actually a lot of, there was actually a lot of debate about how protective masks were and about whether people should wear masks at all. Um, but I think now we actually have fairly good evidence to show that they do help. So next slide. So yeah, what evidence is there that masks even work? Next slide. So there are some laboratory studies in particular, I'm gonna talk about two of them. One is the laser light study, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in May. And what they did basically is they, they uh, set up this um, chamber where uh, there was, they used a green laser light and they could actually see respiratory droplets that were emitted by someone who was talking. So they had this person you know, on one end of the chamber speaking and saying, I think the term that he was using was stay healthy. And they could actually see um, the respiratory droplets and the aerosol that was emitted by this individual talking with and without masks. And it was obvious from the laser light study that when he was not wearing a mask, there was a lot more respiratory drop, droplets emitted from him just speaking as opposed to him when he was wearing um, a surgical or an N95 mask. The next study was uh, a viral shedding study, which looked at a number of respiratory viruses, but in particular, um, influenza and, and uh, COVID, I'm oh, sorry, coronavirus, not necessarily COVID-19. But it showed that those who wear a mask, as opposed to those who didn't wear a mask, showed significant reduction in terms of viral shedding. Next slide. So there are epidemiological studies as well. So um, the mask mandate study actually was done um, in April and May of this year. And they actually looked at 15 states and the, the District of Columbia. Essentially, they looked at these states because they, they instituted mask mandates during that period. And they looked at the daily counts of uh, COVID-19 after they initiated these mask mandates as opposed to prior to that. And it showed in all of these cases that all of these states, the transmission rate declined after they had started the mask mandate. They also, the, the next study was an international cultural norm study, which is they looked at almost 200 countries and um, they looked at almost 200 countries and compared nations where um, it was culturally favorable to wear a mask or where the governments actually in, um, instituted a mask mandate. And they showed that those nations that did have um, a favorable culture, like for example, in Japan. So I was in Japan a few years ago and interestingly, um, even before there was any pandemic, a lot of people there just tend to wear masks. So the same thing is true in Hong Kong probably as a result of SARS from like 20 years ago. So, um, but nations that had this cultural norm or where they instituted a mass mandate had lower death rates than nations that didn't, okay? So next slide. So there are also individual case studies. So in January, there, there was a case of someone flying from China to Toronto. So as you can imagine, you know, this person is on a flight for many hours. And when he arrived in Toronto, they discovered that he had COVID-19. Um, the good thing is that he wore a mask the entire time that he was on the flight. And they, they looked actually at the 25 people that were sitting closest to him on the flight. And you would have thought that at least 
you know, one of those people, you know, would have contracted COVID-19 uh, from their exposure to this, this, uh, this, you know, this person on the flight. But interestingly, all 25 of, the, of those people did not contract um, COVID-19, probably because this guy was wearing a mask the whole time. So the next case was a, case, uh, a couple individuals that were working at a hair salon in Missouri in May. And the sad thing about this case is that these two individuals were symptomatic, but they chose to work and see clients despite being symptomatic. But the good thing is that these two individuals were wearing a mask and all their clients were wearing a mask. So um, they actually, these two individuals though, during that period before, while they were symptomatic and before they realized that they were positive, they, uh, they saw about 140 clients. Well, none of those 140 clients contracted COVID-19. So that, that's a, a pretty impressive case to show how effective masks can be in terms of preventing transmission. So uh, next slide, let's talk a little bit about the different types of masks that there are. So this is a picture of me, I'm wearing, um, I'm wearing an N95 mask. This is the, what they call the duckbill variety, but there are a lot of different um, types of N95 masks. So N95 masks are considered basically the gold standard in terms of protection, in terms of masks. So they, they are, the reason they're called N95s is because they protect you from 95% of particulate matter in the air. Now, I wanna make this point that although they're the gold standard, um, I think for the most part, most people do not really need to wear an N95 mask, okay? These are usually uh, for healthcare workers when they're seeing patients. Um, they are very effective, but um, unfortunately, the, I, I do not wear an N95 mask when I'm in regular clinic seeing my normal patients because I just cannot um, I cannot tolerate wearing an N95 for the, for the entire day. It's just very difficult to breathe through. The running joke that I have is that the 95 and N95 indicates that, um, the, that it blocks also 95% of the oxygen. <laughs> so I know that's not really true, but it feels like that sometimes. So I know I do not wear an N95 for my regular clinic, but I do wear an N95 when I work in respiratory clinic, when I when I'm seeing patients with respiratory symptoms. So Cheryl, is that um, kind of true for you as well? Oh, uh, you're muted. Sorry, it's tricky when I'm sharing screen. Um, yeah, you know, I think it depends. I, I have a different patient base, which with a high uh, percentage of, uh, so it depends. If I'm outside, no, um, if I'm inside, uh, given, given that my population has a pretty high rate of COVID, I do, um, and with a face shield, but I think we have a different patient population. So let me go sure. back to sharing the screen. Okay. So I do also wear a face shield when I see patients, um, but um, I, I, I at least wear a surgical mask. So I want to make that point that I'm always wearing a mask. <clears throat> but I want to make this point clear that for the for most of us in for regular everyday life, you don't need a quote unquote N95 mask. So this is, um, these are, this is my medical assistant, Jennifer. She's wearing a surgical mask. So surgical masks are not considered quite as effective as an N95 mask, but they are easier to breathe through. Um, I do wear these the whole day and they, they do, they are still fairly effective in preventing transmission and probably, they probably block somewhere in the 80 to 90% particulate matter range. <clears throat> so cloth masks. So um, by the way, going back to surgical masks, you can now buy surgical masks at Costco pretty inexpensively. So if you want a surgical mask, you certainly can get them and they're not expensive. Cloth masks, are very common for, I think, the general public. So I know initially in the pandemic, they did not recommend masks for everyone. I think 
the main reason that they did that is because they wanted to make sure that that um, uh, that personal protective equipment that there were enough masks for healthcare professionals. But now the current recommendation is that everyone wear a mask if they can when they're in public. And many people do wear cloth masks. So as you as you would imagine, um, there are many different types of cloth. There are many different um, types of cloth masks. And the thickness of these cloth masks can vary. I know that they actually try to recommend, uh, the CDC and, and World Health Organization recommend that if you wear a cloth mask that it be, that it has triple layers, but I've seen very wide variation in terms of this. I've seen people just pull their t-shirt over their face and that's their mask, but um, that's not very effective. I think one, I think sort of test that you can do um, is if you're wearing your mask and you can still blow out a candle at a foot from your face, that's probably too thin, okay? So this is my son, Aaron. So I wanna make a point here that <clears throat> it doesn't matter what mask you wear, if you are, even if you have an N95, but you're only covering your mouth or covering your nose alone, it's not gonna be effective. So you can see my son here is wearing his mask, but he's not covering his nose. And I cannot tell you how often, but it's very often that I see people doing this. It's really frustrating to me because um, basically that mask is ineffective. So um, I have to basically assume that they're not wearing a mask at all if they're doing this. So I usually encourage them, I usually tell them in a nice way, please try to cover your, your uh, mouth and nose, okay? So a good, um, the proper way to wear a mask is to cover your mouth and your nose, and it should be <clears throat> fairly well fitting, meaning that there's not a lot of space on the sides to for, for air to escape, okay? So it should be well fitting, and it should be covering your mouth and your nose. Next slide. So this is somebody at Home Depot that I took a picture of. Um, he's wearing an N95 mask. But I want to make the point that if you can look in the front of his mask, you can see that there's um, a vent there. So masks with vents or valves, actually, they allow air to escape from the mask, which makes it easier to breathe. But they, they, um, they only protect the wear. So obviously, if this vent is allowing air from his mouth to escape you know, basically unfiltered, then that is a potential risk to those that are around him, okay? So <clears throat> there are, I've seen these masks worn by, you know, a, a number of people in the public. Um, these masks are not recommended by the CDC or the World Health Organization because they don't protect anyone else except the wearer, all right? So keep that in mind. Um, Again, this is actually, uh, this is an old slide, you can skip it. Cheryl, uh, why don't you take it from here, okay? Okay, sounds good. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, all right. Um, so this is, I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, COVID-19 in children. Um, and so, you know, Douglas knows that in the past few days, I've been sort of, um, sort of doing a bit of research to be the most up to date. And I'm just gonna preface this to say that I, I don't think that a lot of this information is out there. It was actually a little surprising uh, when I went through it because I'm not a pediatrician. And so just kind of deep diving, I, I had, there were some surprising conclusions that have come out of the literature uh, recently about this. Uh, this is sort of a summary of what I'm gonna talk about. Um, and, and again, I think a lot of these findings are, are quite surprising. And this was um, out of, uh, I get a lot of my uh, source data from, uh, the UCSF, so University of California, San Francisco, um, they do a series of COVID grand rounds um, every week that I think is uh, very high quality, well done, really looking at the literature as well as um, experiences from their own patients um, and patients also ac across the country. So a couple of key points. Um, surprisingly, children get COVID-19 less often than adults. And when they get sick, they're generally less ill than adults. Um, and I think this number two is quite surprising because I think a, a kind of in the public 
perception, we've heard this term that children are these asymptomatic uh, spreaders. But on the contrary, the data across the, the um, not only the US, but the world show that actually children are not getting it from each other, but they're most often getting the disease from an adult, usually in their household. And they actually, number three, don't seem to be the major sources of transmission to each other, uh, which, is, which is, I think, quite surprising and I think quite life kind of game changing if you kind of really focus in on that. Um, a key point to know, though, is when you talk about the word children um, and COVID-19 is that you really need to delineate in age um, specify, specif specif specificity. And so really, I think the cutoff is really kind of between elementary and middle, middle school with actually, a, I think, a further distinction um, being kids eight and, eight and nine years old and below and 10 and above. Um, and so uh, what, I talk, what I'm gonna talk about in elementary schools is gonna be different than it will be for middle school or high school. Um, and again, contrary to what people might think, um, spreading within the school context um, you know, and I'm again talking about more about elementary school is that adults are more likely to transmit to each other. And I can say that this is what I see in practice. So, you know, I work in a healthcare clinic and I see at lunch times people put their guard down, they sit in the same room eating. Um, and, you know, they're trying to socially distance, but I could see that kind of that familiarity um, could breed potential higher risk of transmission. Um, so I'm not going to get too, too technical, but really what it comes down to, if you look at kind of the science behind it, is that there's this particular gene called ACE2, um, which when you look at this expression, and there was someone who had uh, published this study um, in the past few months, um, and they looked at the gene expression in children uh, less than 10 and children older than 10 and in adults, we see that this particular gene, which is really located in the nasal passages, um, which is really the first point of contact for people to get COVID-19, this gene is really expressed less in, in the younger children. Um, and so really this is the reason why, um, you know, that scientists are using to explain why they're seeing the phenomenon of children getting less or no disease compared to adults. Um, and so, you know, just to kind of deep dive on how are children actually getting to the disease, you know, I know I made that statement about um, children mostly getting it from household contexts as opposed to from each other. Uh, there's been some studies out of China that have done contract tracing. Uh, that was uh, something published in The Lancet, um, which is a major medical journal a few months back. When they did contact tracing, it was mostly from their family that the kids were getting infected. Um, there was a large review study that was done recently um, out of China, US, Singapore, Vietnam, and Korea looking at studies there. Um, and what's called an index case is basically like who was the person that spread the virus to all these people. And what they found was that in less than 10% of cases, uh, the kids were considered the index case. Now, I'm not saying kids don't spread it at all because they do, but if you compare it to influenza, you know, you know, the kids are very infectious. And so, you know, I think normally when we think of viruses, you know, you always think about, you know, if you work in a daycare or if you work with kids, you're going to get sick. You know, I know that when I, um, my kids starting, started to go to school, I was pretty much like sick every week or two weeks. And so I think innately in our kind of mental concept of virus and disease, we always think that children are spreading it to everybody. And, and for most of the cases they are, but what's surprising, and what I want you to remember is that COVID is actually different in its, in its type of spread with, you know, when you consider children and children are not the super spreaders. And yes, they're not doing great hygiene. I know they have their hands all over the place, but for whatever reason, and we think it's because of those ACE2 gene expression, uh, they're actually not the super spreaders that I think we initially thought that they were early in um, kind of, you know, this shelter in place time period. Um, I have to say though, unfortunately, by the time the kids hit middle school and high school, uh, their gene expression is just like adults. And so we've definitely seen reports um, of outbreaks in middle school, high school. And so, you know, I think um, this works nicely because I have elementary school children and I know that they need in-person support more. Uh, and I'm not saying that the middle and high school don't, but I think that the 
younger ages are, are critical in terms of you know needing that kind of in-person school support. So this is a bit heartening to me, I have to say. Um, and I know that you know the caveat is that uh, there's been some um, kind of concern about this condition called the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And so whenever I talk about the reassuring data around children, you know, I think one of the kind of feedback is no, but they can get this terrible inflammatory syndrome. And I can say for sure, it is absolutely terrible. Uh, but what is reassuring about this is that the total number of cases in the US is right now less than 200 in the entire United States. And the predominance of location of this syndrome um, has really been in the cases of where the virus was hit hard in the early days. So the New York and the New Jersey and Michigan um, is really where we've been seeing the bulk of cases of this multi-system inflammatory syndrome. I, I recently heard a report out at Packard uh, from our local Packard Children's Hospital, and they have had no cases of the multi-system inflammatory syndrome. So I hope that that would be reassuring, uh, because I know at times the media can sort of catastrophize uh, conditions without really providing the proper context. And I want to say that um, really, while this is a concerning syndrome, we're not seeing this in large numbers. Um, and so, you know, I think what I um, kind of want to wrap up here in the children is that, again, I'm highlighting, you know, that the adults actually need to be very careful and as well as the middle and, and high schoolers. Uh, but I think there's some reassuring information that we're seeing about uh, elementary school age children. And I think, you know, also in the media, we've been seeing reports about um, kind of maybe outbreaks as schools have opened up, you know, say in Florida or Texas or in Georgia. Um, and kind of the way that people are thinking about this is that, you know, that you're seeing children getting positive cases because they're getting them from their family members because the prevalence of COVID-19 is higher in those states. And so really when they do the contact tracing again, they're seeing that they're getting it from their household. So the outbreak is not generally happening person to person by the children but really it's because the community prevalence is so high. And so that's why, you know, as school systems right now, uh, they're kind of waiting um, for each county to, for the, you know, for the, the community positive rates to come down before they open up schools because they're looking at communities. Uh, because, you know, if, if a kid gets it, um, if, even if they get it from their parents, you know, the school's gonna freak out and, and shut down. And so I think, you know, they're really waiting for the numbers to come down in the community before they open up the schools, but they're not passing them between children in general. I mean, they are, but, but not in large numbers. I know there's been a lot of um, kind of media around the different treatments, like what can we take? You know, is the government hiding something from us as to, you know, and not reporting stuff? So I'm going to just kind of not go over all of them, but just talk about some of the major players. Um, I, I kind of think of the treatment in two categories. Uh, one is that we have uh, medications that uh, block virus um, kind of replication or virus production, um, you know, which includes kind of the famous hydroxychloroquine as well as convalescent plasma. I'll talk about these a little bit more in detail as well as remdesivir. Uh, but there's also a class of medications which affect the immune system called immunomodulatory treatments. And those include dexamethasone or also famous azithromycin. Um, you know, for a lot of other conditions, we have things that attack the specific disease state, but at this time we don't have anything that is specific to COVID-19. Um, so let me talk first about hydroxychloroquine because I know that this has been in the media a lot. Um, and I think just to share the story about hydroxychloroquine um, was that early on in the pandemic, um, we were seeing uh, what's called in vitro studies. And those are studies that are done in the lab, not on humans. And what we were seeing was that um, people picked hydroxychloroquine because it's effective against malaria. Um, and they were basically um, giving hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine to, in the cells, um, so sort of into cell cultures. And they were seeing that um, there was activity against the COVID-19 virus, which is why initially there was a lot of excitement around hydroxychloroquine because they were seeing that in, in vitro. Um, and there were some early case reports which showed a little bit of promising data. Um, and because of this and everybody's excitement to really try to um, stem COVID-19 and throw whatever we could at it to, to help people, 
um, the FDA issued what was called an emergency youth auth authorization for hydroxychloroquine. Um, in fact, even in my hospital, you know, it was on the hospital protocols um, for people that were um, infected in the early days. Um, but in the interim, you know, in the ensuing months after that, uh, there have been a number of studies in vivo, meaning in actual people. And so I think this is an important piece um, for science is really to know that a lot of times that things that work in the lab, you know, on individual cells or even on the individual virus, when you translate that into people and people are much more complex than just individual cells, uh, that oftentimes those initial findings don't bear out when they're, when they're studied in people. And that's, that was what was the case of hydroxychloroquine. And, you know, the data around hydroxychloroquine has been so compelling that it caused the FDA to revoke their um, emergency youth authorization. So I'm just going to share some of the data with you. This was from um, the uh, authors of the recovery trial. So it was nice because in Great Britain, they're able to study through the National Health Service large scale numbers of people with COVID-19 um, in a way that you're not able to do it in the US where you see a lot of um, sort of private stuff happening. Um, and so, you know, they studied thousands and thousands of people and what they were able to see, you know, so in March, they quickly added hydroxychloroquine because of the excitement around it um, to their inpatients. And what this, what this is, this is the highest level of study. So there are a lot of different types of studies out there and people make a lot of um, generalizations based on studies. But in science, the highest quality study is really what's called um, a prospective randomized control trial. So what this means is that it's a type of trial where you take all comers and you take one person and you give them one, um, you know, treatment and you give the other person either placebo or, you know, no treatment at all. Um, and this is much more accurate than taking a set of group of patients and looking backwards and said, okay, these people that I gave hydroxychloroquine got better, um, you know, and so it therefore works. Um, and so, because that can be really rife with a lot of bias, um, not only just personal bias, but scientific bias, you know, where you're really just trying to see an effect. And so the highest quality data comes out of these prospective randomized control trials. And so there was one done um, over at, uh, in the UK. And what they saw from March to June was that there was no reduction in mortality. So what that meant is that people lived just as long, whether they were on hydroxychloroquine or whether they were not. And it was so compelling that difference that there was no difference um, that they basically just stopped the trial um, because you know it was very very clear from the data and the the numbers of people that they used that it was not effective. Um, and you know this was uh, from a recent talk at UCSF. You know they taught they have looked at hydroxychloroquine in people that have been hospitalized, people that are in the outpatient setting, so in the clinics walking around. Um, as well as looking at hydroxychloroquine as a preventive agent. Um, and in all of these trials, um, there was no difference in um, outcomes, whether it be in the getting the illness or in the symptom severity or in mortality. So, you know, I think that unfortunately there has been some um, media around that, you know, we're trying to prevent hydroxychloroquine from getting out to the people. But, you know, really we have now looked at it and this has been a change in the medical viewpoint in you know, the months that we have been um, in this pandemic. And we can, we can confidently say that there is no good evidence to support hydroxychloroquine um, in COVID-19. I think we're all hopeful and, and it, you know, it's not that we're trying to hide that data, but we're really, uh, unfortunately, that, that you know, the case has been closed. And so that's, that's why, um, you know, that's the story behind it. Um, there's some emerging data around what's called convalescent plasma. And so what this is, is it's blood from people who have recovered from COVID-19. And you know, when can you basically infuse that into people who are sick to see if there's better outcomes? Uh, I have to say the data is not out. So we're in the study periods, you know, there's some promising data, but it's a little bit too early to say yes or no. Uh, on the contrary, there is a medication called remdesivir, which is made by Gilead here in the Bay Area which has uh, shown um, some difference in uh, hospitalizations and uh, improvement in uh, outcomes, um, you know, in terms of hospital stays. Uh, and so that has been approved and that is being widely used inside the hospital setting uh, because that is where it has been shown to be effective, it's in the hospital. 
Um, in terms of uh, other treatments that affect the immune system, another, problem, another one that has been shown to be effective is dexamethasone. And so this is another story of that the data changed during the pandemic. So early on, we were hearing information that prednisone was not helpful, which is a derivative of dexamethasone. Uh, we were seeing, you know, gosh, it's, it's not helpful. You know, you should stay away from it. But when they did the studies, and it's that same UK study, uh, they actually are seeing uh, benefits, especially in people that are hospitalized requiring oxygen. So this is beneficial in a certain subset of patients that are quite sick in the hospital, and we are seeing uh, mortality benefits, so meaning that people are, are dying less when they're taking that medication. Uh, azithromycin, I think the jury's still out. We haven't seen a lot of good data uh, as of yet, and so, so far we're not seeing that that's of any benefit. Um, and so what I'm going to do, we're going to open this up to the question and answer. I'm going to stop here. And maybe what we could do is um, we could see if you guys could either raise hands or put questions in the chat, and we'll field some questions. And I want to be mindful we have six minutes left until 11. So if you are <laughs> got something at 11, please feel free. I think we'll go to 11.15 and maybe do a hard stop then. Okay, so we have a question here um, from the chat box, and the question is, uh, do we see transmission in swimming pools? Um, and so my understanding is actually is that uh, the transmission in chlorinated water itself, uh, you are not, there is no transmission that is in the water, but uh, the transmission that is occurring is the social behaviors around swimming pools which are the hanging out, the picnics, uh, and that is what's causing the transmission. Um, but if you're just going in to swim and get out, then you're fine. And that's why uh, swing pools have been opened on limited bases. So, the next question, uh, I guess from George, talking about why is Santa Clara County's mortality rate lower than the US, I mean, lower than the national rate, I guess. And uh, I guess that, you know, I, I would have to say that, you know, here in the Bay Area, we actually are, our access to healthcare and the quality of healthcare that we have here is very good compared to the national level. So I, I that's what I attributed to. I also attributed to the fact that, um, you know, nationally, uh, um, there are there have been areas where their healthcare systems have been overwhelmed, and that is not not true here. So, um, Cheryl, any thoughts on that as well? Yeah, I also think that um, some of it could be affected by the denominator. So, meaning that um, your percentage is based on the total number of people tested, and I do think that we have pretty robust access to testing here in the Bay Area and we're testing a lot of people. And so I think that our mortality rate, you know, I, I agree, Lawrence, that we do have better access to healthcare here. So I do agree that that is some contributing factor, but I also think that we're testing a lot more here as well. So I think that we're catching more positives um, because we're testing more. And I think that people are maybe testing less in other areas. Um, and so, you know, it, it may look like their numbers are a little bit more uh, because they're not the total number of testing or percentage is lower as well. Sure, sure. Um, what is this? Is three percent asymptomatic contraction recovery. Let, let me clarify because the question got kind of yeah. Big. That's yeah. a really long question. <laughs> yeah, what what are you trying to ask? There's actually five questions there. The, the, second, <laughs> the second one is um, asymptomatic contraction recovery. Does it affect whether somebody's going to catch COVID again or? If they do catch it again, will they be more or less asymptomatic? So there are some documented cases now of individuals who've had COVID-19 who do acquire COVID-19 again. Um, uh, there was a case in Hong Kong recently of somebody who contracted it, although it was a different strain of the virus. Um, in his case, he was asymptomatic the second time that he got it. So. Um, it's probable that his first bout gave him some degree of immunity that gave him some protection, but nonetheless, he was able to contract another, another strain of the same virus. 
So um, it's, it does, basically what that means is that um, you probably do get some protection if you get COVID-19 going forward. Um, how long that lasts, we don't really know. Um, uh, even though he was able to get it, he was asymptomatic. So that, you know, does indicate that, that uh, there is some benefit from having, um, you know, experience with, with uh, COVID-19. But, um, but right now, it's still very unclear about how long that, that protection or immunity lasts. So that's, and that also is a question about vaccines going forward as well how effective will a vaccine that we develop be and for how long does that immunity last and how much protection does that really give you? Um, it may be that when they develop a vaccine that it doesn't actually fully protect you against COVID-19, but it may lessen the severity of the course. Mm -hmm. So, which would also be fine because if it can lower the fatality rate, that'd be great. So um, I see that there's a question from Selena about, um, because she works with mentally ill folks that don't have uh, follow the precautions well, and she's asking what would be appropriate for PPE. And so Selena, I think you and I have a similar patient population. I can say 95% of my patients do not wear a mask appropriately, and they wear it like Lawrence's um, a son in that second picture. And so kind of my safety things are, is if I can see them outside, I'll see them outside. So that's kind of my number one thing. If I can't see them outside, uh, you know, and actually now, even if I'm outside, I will still wear uh, a mask and a face shield. And because I feel that my patients, and I think yours too, Selena, I mean, they have, they're less aware of kind of the precautions, um, you know, and they are the folks that are, you know, in our county, the folks that are getting it, you know, it's uh, disproportionately um, people of color and uh, low income. And so I, I am wearing a face uh uh, I'm wearing a face shield as well as a mask on all my encounters, uh, especially inside. Um, so Quinn, I guess, had an ask a uh, question about cleaning or washing the mask. Um, you know, I think you can probably treat the, the mask just like any article of clothing, just put it in the washer. If you want to wash it by hand, that's probably fine too, but that would probably be effective if you, if you wash that mask put it in a dryer, that probably will be fine in terms of cleaning it. Um, uh, or, if, and, and if you wash it pretty thoroughly with soap and water, you probably can just hang it to dry and that probably would be okay as well. Um, I see Ada has a question here. The length of contagious period once the person is tested positive. Um, so basically, you know, initially in the outbreak, you know, the, the kind of the golden number was 14 days. So I don't know if you guys all remember that, right? So you would have to isolate or quarantine for 14 days, but public health in the past month has changed that uh, to 10 days. And so they've shortened that. And so basically, if you are positive for COVID-19, you only have to quarantine um, and kind of stay out uh, for 10 days now, uh, unless of course you're kind of going to a very like a shelter or a massive public kind of location, but really they're, uh, they don't believe that you're spreading after 10 days and there is no utility to be testing after you test positive because there's a lot of what's called viral shedding. And so, you know, our, what the tests do is they, they capture kind of DNA particles or RNA particles of the virus, but it doesn't actually tell you whether they're active or not. And so we know that after 10 days, uh, we're not seeing active transmission. Um, and so the, the spread is kind of from that kind of initial 10 days. And so the question is, is it limited through the incubation and symptomatic period or through the recovery period? You know, I think we don't know because we're still figuring it out, but I think basically that that's 10 days. And so that's kind of when, when you kind of think you got it or exposed, that's kind of the safety period now. Right. Any other questions? These are some really great questions. Going back to, why don't we go back to George? He had a few questions. If we don't have any other questions, is there anyone else that has a question? So George, I'm sorry, what, what were your I other questions? I have a question, question. Oh, Lawrence. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, sorry, about um, like touching mail and mailbox and grocery bag and, you know, just you know what I mean, the daily yeah. stuff. So any advice on that? Yeah, so you know, um, 
you know, I don't think you need to be overly concerned about catching COVID-19 from fomites, which is a fomite is an inanimate object like a doorknob or a countertop or a mailbox or like a shopping bag, okay? Um, the, the, the survivability of the virus does vary depending on the surface that we're talking about. I think usually metal or plastic, they can last there for the longest period, like usually like days. Um, but to be honest with you, there are not, uh, it's not as big a concern as like being in close contact with an individual. So I don't want you to get obsessive about like, um, about, you know, you know, um, worrying about touching a doorknob or, or things like that. Again, my, my advice is wash your hands often or use hand sanitizer often, but actually washing your hands is actually even more effective. So wash your hands thoroughly and often. Um, and, um, you know, you know, try to, you know, avoid touching areas that you know are high traffic areas for other people. Like, like a doorknob or a handle, okay? But I don't think you need to be overly worried about catching COVID-19 from those sort of surfaces, okay? So in, in my long post, uh, each of the questions begins with an equal sign. I don't know why some of them got wrapped together. Okay, why don't you just ask us? Your questions were all sort of jumbled together. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, what's the utility privacy um, and options we have with regard to contact tracing phone apps? Yeah, I know that um, in sort of different countries like um, Australia, that's been one that's, um, you know, been used. I can, I can say, you know, just, um, yeah, I, I have to say, you know, when I, I think in the United States, you, you know, you have the kind of comment there that you wrote about privacy. And I think that's, you know, I think here in America, there's, a, you know, definitely a sense of, um, you know, wanting to maintain privacy, not wanting my data or information to get out. So to be honest, I don't think that's likely something, you know, because of the nature of uh, the United States that that's going to be widely uh, used and um, basically bought into across the country. I mean, there may be pockets like, say, in California, where that might, you know, see some kind of uptick or whatever, but I don't think that my guess is just based on our own politics within our country, that's not likely to, to happen. I mean, whether it's, I mean, it sounds like a great idea. I mean, I know that in the Asian countries, uh, you know, you know, where basically they're tracking you on your cell phone, it's very effective. Um, but unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, however your viewpoint is, um, but I, I don't think that that's going to go mainstream here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree. Any evidence of uh, genetic or um, phenotype predisposition? So again, um, you know, right now, I, I think it's too early in terms of that sort of data, but, you know, clearly the Hispanic or Latino community seems to be at greatest risk right now. Um, you know, as you saw from the the demographics earlier they more than half the cases in santa clara county are in that community um, and that's not just true here that's true in other states and other communities as well so um again i don't i don't think that this is attributable more to genetics i think it's more to cultural norms and to socioeconomic factors but um but that question still um, it still is up in the air. I think uh, several months back, hydrochloroquine um, was uh, declared very effective in the Jewish population around New York City. And I'm wondering um, you know, why, why has it been so sensationalized as a treatment? Yeah, that's a, yeah, I don't know why that particular medication has been called out so much in the sensationalism. I think, you know, my sense is that, you know, it's pretty readily available um, and it's cheap. And so I think, you know, there was some early uh, anecdotal data, you know, and, you know, I think there's been some reports 
uh, you know, from doctors stating that it's been helpful in their patient population. And so I think, you know, why that particular one over others, I'm not sure, um, but it's been interesting to see that there's been so much focus and attention. I mean, it, yeah, for sure, that's the one that's the standout. Well, I mean, um, why, I'm just gonna add my two cents here. You know, uh, as Cheryl mentioned earlier, you know, there was some early in vivo data that, that gave people hope that, you know, perhaps hydroxychloroquine could be effective in terms of COVID-19. And there was a French study that was initially put out, a very small study from France that, um, that showed that hydroxychloroquine could clear um, nasal swabs of, of positivity faster than those who, did, who weren't on it. But um, it was a very small and, and uh, in my opinion, a very kind of flawed study. But um, I, I think part of the reason it was sensationalized is that, you know, um, early on, I think the term that the president used was game changer for this, even though the data was still very far off from conclusive. And that put a lot of, that put it on the map. And a lot of people were asking about it at that point. But um, I think as Cheryl showed, you know, there is a lot of evidence now to show that it really is not um, very effective in terms of treating COVID-19. And, um, you know, the VA study, there was a VA study done that showed that um, the mortality rate for those who were on hydroxychloroquine with or without is azithromycin, their fatality rate was actually significantly higher. I think um, there's another question here that um, asking about recommendations for visiting uh, at risk family members, um, you know, especially ones that are far away. I think this is such a real question because, you know, the mental health and the relational health is, is so important because, you know, if we know this is not going away, you know, we want to see our family members and how safe is that? We don't want to give them anything. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's hard to give a black and white answer, but I think as Lawrence was mentioning in that flight study, I meaning we are seeing that the masks, the, you know, appropriate masking, um, you know, while in flight or while traveling or while, because, you know, in a flight, you really don't, you know, have the option. You have to be sitting next to people. Uh, so if you're in a situation where you, where you cannot distance, uh, you absolutely have to wear a mask. And um, I think you're, you're pretty protected. And then when you go visit your um, elderly family members, if they wear a mask and you wear a mask and you, know, you, you try to distance, you know, I mean, can you hug? I mean, if you do a quick hug, it's probably okay. Um, but I think in terms of the talking and the speaking, you know, it's better to stand back a little bit. Um, so I, I absolutely think it's, it, it is, it's, it's okay. I just think that, um, but the person, just definitely should take precautions. Um, and it's, it's so hard because I know a lot of grandparents have been very lonely not seeing their grandchildren in this time period. Well, just to piggyback on that, um, I actually have had a few patients who were in the situation that I gave some advice to. And, and to add on to that, I actually recommended that um, while they're on the flight not to eat or drink anything, just keep the mask on the entire time um, so, uh, in order to protect themselves and to protect others, perhaps, and, and um, you know, another thing that, that some people are doing, you know, this is, um, you can um, get tested for COVID-19 prior to your trip. So, there are actually some states that will not allow you to fly into their state unless you are tested within the, a few days prior to flying. So, um, so I know Alaska for sure does that. And um, uh, there are other states that do that as well. But um, if you are greatly concerned, one thing that, another thing you can do is you can, you can talk to your doctor, perhaps um, they can arrange for you to get tested, like just a nasal swab. If they can't do that, I know with Palo Alto Medical Foundation, our requirements, our criteria for testing that is not meeting their criteria for testing. But Santa Clara County does have testing sites where you can any, they'll take all comers. So you just gotta arrange that before, uh, before your trip. 
but keep in mind that the turnaround time for results can vary widely. And, um, you know, as I would probably do it at least five or six days prior to your trip in order to get the results before your trip. Okay. Um, and, uh, and also another, another place that you can also do is El Camino hospital. So keep that in mind. Good. Um, and we have a last question we'll take here. Uh, how are mental health issues being addressed mainly for um, whose mental health have been exacerbated by sheltering in place? Yeah, absolutely. I think that is, you know, um, poverty and mental health are really um, kind of the, the terrible fallouts of this pandemic. I mean, we are definitely seeing, um, you know, an increase of all kinds of underlying depression and mental health uh, disorders. Um, and in, even in people that don't have underlying disorders, I mean, I think everyone could probably speak to their own experience of really just kind of going going crazy. And once the fires hit, that was, you know, it was really terrible to not be able to go outside. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think it, what's hard is that, you know, the kind of the standard things that you would normally recommend, which is being around people or groups or that sort of thing is much harder. Um, and so, you know, I, what I'm recommending to people is that they do visit with their friends and family um, that are, that provide support, but just do it at a safe distance, you know, so, you know, no large gatherings, but, you know, getting together with one or two people or a few people, you know, outside. I mean, we're so fortunate to live in California where we can do that. Um, you know, people wearing masks, and then I think, you know, we're, we're keeping a safe distance. That's, um, I think that's how I, I would recommend, because mental health is real. I mean, it's definitely, it's, and this is such a long haul, so it's, it's a tough time. Yeah, so um, just to piggyback on that, you know, I've, I've actually had a number of patients who um, I don't see as much depression, at least in this area, but, but at least for my subset of patients, but I have seen a fair amount of anxiety. And, and a lot of that comes from, um, you, know, you know, when you watch the news, uh, the, the, the news about COVID-19 every single day, and it's on all the time, um, it tends to, 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 to um, for some people, it tends to make them quite anxious. Um, and um, so I have seen more, I think more anxiety rather than depression, but, you know, depression can also, you know, I, again, this is something that uh, was brought up to me by one of my patients, like talking about, you know, the effects of COVID-19, of shutting down, what, what does that, um, you know, job losses, how does that affect people's mental st state? And um, so um, he, his argument against shutting down was that um, there, are, you know, what is the, the suicide rate when we're in a recession? And, um, and I, I'm, I think that's certainly a concern, you know, I think, um, you know, when we shut down, it has broad, and widespread effects upon not just the economy, but, about, but upon um, many, I mean, our lives in many different ways. And it affects our, all of our mental health to some degree because our, our lives are so thoroughly changed. But, um, but at the same time, my argument to him was, um, you know, I'm not, we're not seeing a thousand people die from suicide every day right now. We are seeing a thousand people die from COVID-19 every day, and that's that's a significant number. And um, so, although that might be true that um, shutting down has an impact, a significant impact on our society, on our mental health. Um, you know, this the pandemic is real, and it is it is serious and it is something that we have to take seriously and, and take precautions um, and be careful. So um, that, that was, that, that's just uh, my two cents on that, okay? Great, so we're at time. So thank you everyone for coming. I, thanks for a great discussion. Hope that was helpful. Great. Thanks for coming guys. Thanks for hosting. Not at all.